It's high summer in Tassie, and but for a little worrying smoke haze through the valley these past few days, there's a lot to feel great about. These are little, tiny little cucumbers. Looks like a mini watermelon. Could have been a bit riper, but sweet, delicious. I call them mouse melons, kids will love them. 12 months ago, Sadie and I set out to future-proof Fat Pig Farm by thinking more deeply how to invest in the long-term health of our soil. And when I think back on all the work we've done and all the things we've learned, I can honestly say we've given this last year a red-hot go. You know, when you buy a farm, you think, oh, we'll just start, we'll, we'll make a couple of changes and then just start growing stuff. But it's, it's this constant thing, what have we done? What are we doing now? What do we hope to achieve? Are we on the right track? Are we getting to where we want to be in the long run? We started last autumn by taking soil samples from all over the farm and having them analysed. We'll see what we're doing over the next 12 months, if it makes any difference. We sought advice from Hannah Maloney, a permaculture designer and educator, on how to conserve our rainwater runoff and prevent erosion. So at the moment, the, the water's just going straight down the hill. Yes, so you want to slow sink and store it in the soil. On her advice, we terrace the slopes of our property with these water channels, or swales. If we slow the water down and we grow more stuff on this piece of land, this will exist for 100, 200, 300 years. They might even put more of them in. We were determined to tackle our blackberry infestation, but not poison our earth with chemical herbicides. Instead, we put these guys to work. The way they're kind of chowing down here. It's a hungry patch for goats. Hungry patch for goats. Two. It's been a huge year of change for us and the farm. No job too big, no job too dirty. Whew. Only farming would be pushing poo uphill sometimes, but not pushing poo around on, with a stick. My name is Matthew Evans. After years as a big city food critic, I bought a farm in Tasmania to better understand what I eat by growing it myself. I built a restaurant right at the top of the farm, but now I want to get a better understanding of what I eat, eats. This means starting from the ground up to improve the health of our soil, our farm and our food for generations to come. From foodie to farmer to chef to rehabilitator of the land, how hard can it be? Pick, pick, pick. Come on. The challenges a farmer faces every day are what make the job interesting. Come on. But I reckon overcoming those challenges is what makes the job meaningful. I've just picked up our um, second test of the soil on the farm. It's about a year since we did the first ones. And I'm really interested to see what's happened. We can see the changes, but, you know, how has it actually made any difference in the soil? In terms of the swales, it's only a year, and in historical terms, that's not very long. Maybe there'll be some changes there. Can't wait to talk to Sadie about it, though. Hello. Oh, hello. Look what I've got. Soil tests. And it's got the, it's got the garden and the farm oh, on, on all of it. Ooh, this is exciting. Do you, will you understand all that? Because I don't actually understand some of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. The real things we're interested in here is the organic matter. This bit here, this is the nutrient profile. So Phosphorus, these are... Phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, all that stuff. The most important one here is boron. Boron. Boron is a really lovely indicator because it's the first thing to be leached out of the soil. And it's also a mineral that's super important for the other minerals to work. We were down last year and yep. it's perfect. But if you just look at this from a distance... Yeah, oh, I can see so it now. anything dark <laughs> <laughs> means we have to look at it. Yeah. And if you look last year, there's a lot of dark over the one, two, three, five yep. places that we tested. Yep. And here, much less dark. The vegetables that Nadia is growing in this garden and bring up to the kitchen are so delicious and beautiful looking and healthy. And that is borne out by this test, which is showing that our soil is also rich and, and healthy. And it's from what we've done. Cause, yes. Because that wasn't like that. Yes, absolutely. When we this first arrived. This is to arrive. do with the compost that we've been putting on and the minerals that we've been putting on and the worm juice that we've been putting on. Yeah, right. So. Good numbers. Yeah. How's the rest of the farm look? All right, let's have a look. 
but the biggest job we faced by far was to improve the soil health in our sloping paddocks by planting new trees and digging these swale channels to make better use of our rainwater. We don't have good phosphorus in this paddock. And last year, I remember they said you could throw some lime on it if you want yeah. to bring that up. Which we haven't done. And we've done absolutely nothing. Yeah. And you know, the effect of doing absolutely nothing was nothing. Yes. So that didn't work. Yes. Well, it worked, it worked. in the sense of we know that we need to do something. All right. So all that we haven't really seen great change. No, but this is, uh, you know, this is only a year and yeah. not even a year if you think about how long it actually took us to make those changes. Which were a couple of months, a few months in. Yeah, absolutely. So I think from, from our perspective, my perspective, building these, they cost a lot of money actually. And it's not just the digging, but it's the fencing, that's the planting of the trees, the cost of the trees themselves. And we're not, we're not seeing any benefit after a year or part of a year, the future generations are going to get the benefit. Our son, our grandchildren will actually mm. see what happens with the soil. And that, I mean, that's, that makes it all worthwhile because we're only caretakers of this land for like a moment in time. Yeah, what's important as farmers is that we start taking a much longer view of our land. When you really boil it down, our challenge over this last year has been very simple. How can we live and farm sustainably? Well, last autumn, native plant expert Chris Schaefer and a few local school kids helped us plant a garden of native edibles as one way of harvesting food without depleting the soil. It's going to be a long-term project, this. This is after nearly a year. It's not exactly as big as I thought it would be. The idea with this, this garden is not to provide the bulk, but it's hopefully going to drive the flavour of our kitchen in years to come. You know, they're like herbs and, and spice to, to actually embellish all the meals that we create and make it taste like this part of southern Australia. OK. This is a pepperberry plant. So while this isn't fruiting yet, these leaves have got a herbaceous spiciness to them. Got those beautiful leaves. I have to pick over those make sure there's no dirt on them. So I want to make an ice cream. Like, I love that idea of making an ice cream. And so the first thing I need to do is just um, pound these little leaves in my mortar. I'm not trying to make a paste. Just bruise them a little bit. Oh, I can already smell them. The aroma is quite amazing. OK, just grab my milk. To make ice cream, the, the classic way is to make a custard. This is my favourite thing on the whole farm. So, heating the milk, really just to get the flavour out of those leaves. And it's just started to foam and just almost boiling, so I'm just going to turn that off now. Oh yeah, so while that steeps, um, I can get on with the next bit, which is uh, making um, the base for the custard. I'm really looking forward to, to seeing how this works. These are the ancient traditional flavours from Tasmania, from this corner of the world. So I'll set the timer for 20 minutes. Let that churn. It'll get lighter in colour and more air and hopefully um, taste amazing. Fingers crossed. Here we go. So I can imagine that, you know, the height of summer with really sweet, sour strawberries, cool climate strawberries, and a little bit of the ground um, pepperberry. So I might put a bit of that on and might see if the boys want to try some. Headley, Cormac, who likes ice cream? Me! <laughs> you want to try some? Yes, yeah. please. Come and have a taste of this. Here's a spoon. There you go, Cormac. So, what do you reckon? Delicious. It's really good. Thumbs up. Getting your thumbs up, that's one of the hardest things ever. Forget, true. Forget the food critics. <laughs> it is true, isn't it? Once upon a time in Tasmania, summer was the season the whole state looked forward to the most. Long, warm days, seldom above 30 degrees. Clear blue skies and fresh ocean winds filled with some of the cleanest air on the planet. But this has been the state's hottest January ever recorded. Fire danger will be high. Fire under these conditions will be difficult to control. Burning embers may start new fires, which may threaten your home before the main fire comes. The landscape is bone dry, 
and the smoke haze that's been steadily filling the valley these last few weeks has our whole community worried sick. This summer, Tasmania has exploded in fire. So we're under this watch and act alert. What that means is we have to constantly check what's going on. Have the animals ready, have the house ready. We've actually got a bag packed in the car. It's got our passports, birth certificates, um, everything of value, um, so that we can leave at a moment's notice. There's all these bits of, you know, this is a bit of charcoal that's fallen from the sky. I picked it up just out there, but then I get in the paddock and then there's leaves. Look at that, it's sort of half burnt leaves. There's another piece of charcoal. This has been falling out of the sky for days. And all we need is one of those, instead of being so half burnt or, you know, fully burnt, if it lands while it's still burning, up goes the whole place. It's been six weeks since the state's most destructive bushfire season in years. A change has come through, and with the fires under control, life has returned to normal. So I've decided that it's time for this weary farmer to take some time out with a little fishing trip. And that's why I put in a call to my old mates, one of which I haven't seen in ages. And they must be close, because Carrie can smell a clown a mile off. Howdy, stranger. Hello, mate. How are you? Long time no see. <laughs> you How's made it. Look who made parole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I finally got let out. Yeah, it's good. Came back. Hey, mate. Uh, my mate uh, Nick Haddo has a farm just across the river from me yeah. and he's yeah. one of Tassie's most passionate <laughs> cheesemakers. You know, start looking... But I haven't seen my old friend Ross O'Mara since he moved to the mainland as head chef of a posh Victorian country club. How's the place going? Looks great. Oh, Sadie's done a lot of work got, here. Hasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you can do a lot of work over the next couple of days. Well, we go fishing. Yeah. We're headed west for the Tyena River in central Tassie, one of the state's best trout fishing rivers. But not 45 minutes out of Fat Pig Farm, along this old timber road, the overwhelming damage done by our recent bushfires is kind of unnerving. Especially for Ross, who only experienced it on the nightly news. It was a tense few days, Rossy. Yeah. yeah everyone was a bit thin-lipped. Yeah, thin-lipped and underslept. So that's the northern edge of it, and it yeah. started to, you know, it was coming this way. Given that our place is only a couple of k's that way, I'm very grateful. Yeah. Over 3% of the entire state was consumed by fire this summer. Fortunately, no lives were lost. But we've heard about a true Tassie wild man living out here along the upper Huon River, whose beloved forest home was totally destroyed. Let's hope the hairy man is up for visitors. How we doing? Hey, Maze. Hey. Hey, I'm Good Harry. Hey, I'm Nick. How Nick. are you? Good nice to meet you. How are you going? I'm, I'm Matthew. Yeah, go, Matthew. How are we? Yeah, great. You know, you're, you're the hairy man? That's it. That's Harry's. it. What do we call you, Harry? Yeah, Harry. Harry's. Uh, Harry's this is Ross. Mate. Ross. Yeah, good, good, good. He's the other hairy man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the hairy man, also known as Dale Fullard, lost the house and sculpted gardens he'd built out here in the wilderness to the bushfires inferno. <laughs> Luckily, his studio was spared in the blaze. So did it just rip around this whole area here and just kind of keep that one? Yeah, it came in the back of that. You were long gone? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't breathe in here. But, um, I last left here when the fire was actually out the back of the studio. Pretty full on, like there's, there's pretty well, she's burnt down at ground level all the way through the property. You must be devastated. Yeah, but it's it's also, I don't know, you know, it's a new page. You know, it's just see what the bush does. The bush will come back in, in you know, mightn't be in my lifetime. We're all temporary. The ferns are sprouting. I mean, you know, the gum tree's already popping shoots out at the base. I yeah. mean, we're looking at uh, coming on about six weeks ago. That's pretty quick. It is. It, really it, well, especially considering it's, it's been dry. Like, before the fire, the ground was just crunching underneath the feet. Right. According to Harry, he left city life and moved out here 12 years ago to be alone with nature and to inspire his sculpture and music. So it's not surprising he's transforming this experience with song. But it was surprising when he wanted to play it for us. If I came down and swept the valley clean, it took away my home, it took away my dreams. Some people saying trees will all grow back. Just you wait and see. 
Fire at Harry's place, so hot, it melted glass. It melted, you know, really thick corrugated iron and steel. And, and yet, six weeks later, we've got plants coming back from the earth. I think what I'm really surprised at, so quickly, in such a dry summer, we're already seeing new growth. And that's heartening. With the burnt out forest of Hairy Man's place behind us, the countryside further west towards the Tyana River seems to have escaped any damage from the summer fires which is just as well, because the Mountfield National Park, about two and a half hours from Fat Pig Farm, is home to some of Tasmania's iconic swamp gums. It's actually fairly clear under here, there's lots of ferns. Yeah. And if you've never seen a tree almost twice as tall as the MCG, it's worth a look. Oh, look at this. Look at that one. Oh, geez. Oh, what's that, 70, 80 metres? Hard to tell, isn't it, from here? Now, do you think this would have been like what Harry Mann's place was when he's talking about all the man ferns and all the stuff that was down? Oh, the really? I don't say that. Yeah, probably. It makes me even yeah. sadder about it, just that this is what it was and looking at what it is now. Yeah. You're right, though, because things like this were all burned. All those man ferns burned to the ground. That. That's the oh, mother. Yeah. Wow. That is the thick one, isn't it? Look at that base. Holy moly. Man, I could almost, like, hide in one of these bases. It's amazing when you're here amongst some, this is like three, probably 400 years old. You know, this is the tallest flowering species of tree in the world. And in the Tasmanian soil, it grows so high and so well. Some of these trees were here when the first European came to, to Tassie, when Abel Tasman first sailed around the coast. Not our oldest trees, but our tallest. Before Europeans arrived, Tasmania was covered in swamp gums like this, as tall as 90 metres. Today, there are only 180 true giants left in the whole state. And unfortunately, we lost 15 of those in the summer fires. I love coming to these sort of ancient Tasmanian landscapes. And when I come, I often think not just about this place, but about humans generally and what we're doing. And every time we feed ourselves or clothe ourselves, house ourselves, we change landscapes. So this has been here forever. Our farm used to look something like this. But when I, I look at the farm, I go, well, we've got to create a whole new ecosystem, have something that lives on for generation to generation, like these forests have lived on for hundreds of years. Can we do that in a farming sense? Remains to be seen, but at least we're giving it a crack. Fishing trips with my mates were only about catching fish, they would have ended a long time ago. Because it's not the fish I'm after, it's the sense of freedom you can only find in truly wild places. And after a huge year of running a farm and a restaurant, the Tyana River in central Tasmania is just the kind of wild I'm in need of. The river is famous for its wily brown trout. So to even up the odds slightly, we've teed up our good friend and master fishing guide, Plinio. Oh, hey, it's the fish whisperer. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I've been fishing with Plinio many times since I came to Tassie. We don't call him the fish whisperer lightly. Another one. That's a gorgeous one. That's a nice little stream trout. Yeah, perfect. Where do you want us to go? Walk up there, walk straight around and go 10 metres further up. Yeah. Leapfrog each other. Otherwise, we'll spend too long on already fished water, you know? Yeah. Perfect. Straight in your finger? <laughs> oh. Straight in my finger. I'm not a natural fisherman by any stretch. Yeah. That's the one, that's the one. But it doesn't take long to realise that fishing on a river like this for hours... Here we go. ..to appreciate a trout for seconds, even if it's small, is worth every moment. Brownie, 
brownie. Yeah. Look how red they, they spots colour are. up in yeah. there. Don't have Catch to be... that, Matthew. Yeah, I caught that one, Ross. <laughs> but that? it's not quite a size, so, you know. It probably is size. Oh, it is? But, yeah. Oh, it is too. Oh, Whoa! There it goes. Because the Tyana is densely overhung with trees, Plinio wants us to use a slingshot method of casting to avoid getting snagged. Oh, got the tree. You're in the tree. <laughs> and if you do it right, it's more accurate. Ross has just um, saw this little freshwater crayfish, like a, a little yabby. And Australia, the world's biggest freshwater crayfish comes from Tassie. It can be up to a metre in length. Probably not this little guy grow up to a metre. Don't know if they're protected, don't know anything about this species, but we'll just um, let it go, I reckon. Try as we may, with the sun getting low in the sky, we had to admit that the Tyana's brown trout had outsmarted us. So it was finally time to call it a day. Thankfully, Plinio had caught a fish this morning before we arrived, so we didn't have to go home without something for the barbie. Well, there we go. Same old, same old. <laughs> uh, reputation's unsullied. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. there we go. Is that how they look? Yeah. That's what they look like. And we can eat that. We can have that. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're going to need a fish. It was we... a beautiful day out. It was a nice day. Yeah. It was good to good see him. And water. I feel confident to go and do that by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could go and catch no, no fish on my own now yeah. um, pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was fun. Pretty, that was really good. It was fun. brilliant. Was thank really you. Good. It's been 12 years since I left the big city and moved to Tasmania. And the way I see it, adventures like this are the reward for taking the plunge and remaking my life in such a beautiful part of the world. So there's no better way to celebrate what's been a huge year in the life of Fat Pig Farm than to fire up our incredible new fire pit for a little alfresco dinner, Tassie style. Thanks for coming Cheers. down. Cheers. Cheers. That was a fun weekend. It was great, wasn't it? It was good. It was great. I'm going to make you cook now, Rossi. What do you want to do? I'll give I'll... him the meat. Yeah, I'll do the veggies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll do the veggies. No brainer. With Ross and Nick on the tools cooking some fresh steak and veg, I've got a simple idea for our little brown trout. So I've taken the guts out and I'm just going to fill that little cavity um, of the fish with the dill um, and hopefully that'll hold inside while it cooks over the, the smoky um, grill over there. Not too smoky. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to our menus, we've done a lot of experimentation this year. Some are still works in progress, like our honey mead, which I still think needs a little work on the fermentation. <laughs> they say that honey's pretty, um, pretty good for you in a medicinal sense. <clears throat> Not sure if it's going to cure a headache or give you one. But some were huge successes, like having local distiller Nat Fryer help flavour our own fat pig gin with wild kunzia and fennel from the garden. It's the oils and the aromas that are important when you're thinking about gin. You want to have a try? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fat Pig Farm gin, batch number one, 42%. 42%. 42. We're just having it neat. Oh, I can smell it. I just mm. got a big bottle. You got it? Yeah, yeah, me too. It's beautiful. Don't spill it, man. Oh, no, I know. Jesus, 42%. So we need that fire. <laughs> I love our boys' weekends. Wow. They're good. <laughs> They're good, aren't they? They're a bit different from before, though. Yeah, Your yeah. weak bladder, his dicky ankles, and my Your dodgy knee. knees, and we're in bed by nine o'clock. <laughs> It's a lot different than it used to be. Mm. Oh, that's really good. It's got a good lens, good citrus. Mm. That's delicious, Evo. But when it comes to man hours, nothing tops the effort we put into growing our own wheat to make our first loaf of fat pig bread. If you've got about the same as me, it should be enough to do a yeah. loaf. All right. We'll start with that and see how it goes. It looks great. Oh, oh, it's just wheat, isn't it? It's, it's the wheatiest wheat smell you've ever smelt. It's nutty and interesting. Oh, yeah. This is the first loaf. This was 700 grams. So this loaf, adding up the hours to, you know, as a proportion of what we got, which is, mm. you know, there's only, I don't know, 50 loaves or something out there, this is $200 to, to um, produce this loaf. Wow. <laughs> anyway. It's like I made so, it. It sounds like our business all over again. <laughs> <laughs> it does a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Hey, guys. Hey. Hello. Hello. Of course, ours isn't the only farm to have had a big year. Nick's had a huge year experimenting with dual-purpose cattle breeds he can use for milk and beef. So who brought the steak as backup? Yeah, I did. That's actually the first yearling that has come off our farm, our dairy really? farm. I'm so excited. <laughs> it should no, be cooked up really well, Nick. Oh, my God. 
Oh, that's really good. For Sadie and Headley and I, this humble little fireside gathering is the perfect way to reflect on what this last year of our lives has meant to each other and to our farm. Sometimes I pinch myself when I'm walking up here to the restaurant. I can't believe that it's here and we're here and the farm's here. This thing that we had in our heads actually exists. And, it doesn't, and it's not just in the middle of a hay paddock now. It's, like mm. it's getting things around it that give it a sense of place. It was no small thing to reinvent our lives in Tasmania. And over the last 12 months, we've learnt that it's no small thing to reinvent the way we farm our food. But whenever I thought that a challenge was too big to face, I could always count on Sadie to lean in and say, how hard can it be? Here's to us. Here's to us. Here's, Here's to Headley. Here's to, yeah. Here's to Ross and Nick. Here's to the whole thing. Here's to the whole thing.